Good morning, everyone. So um, I am the Orchard Systems Advisor from Madera and Merced Counties, um, although I only cover almonds in Madera County um, with the University of California Cooperative Extension. So I have a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to go through pre-plant amendments. I'm going to go over rootstocks briefly, and then I'm going to go over post-plant fertilization and spend some time talking about some research that I've done on phosphorus fertilization of newly planted almonds. Pre-plant soil modification is really important because if you have some severe problems at the site that you are thinking about planting almonds in, the best time to do it is pre-plant. While it is very common for folks to surface apply gypsum, sulfur, sometimes lime, although it's pretty rare here in California, the mobility of those chemicals deeper into the soil is limited. It takes a long time for them to affect conditions deeper in the soil. So if you have some really serious issues that you need to fix, or you want to leach salinity from deeper in the soil profile, the best way to do it is to actually mix those chemicals into the soil. Those products tend to be pretty insoluble. They take months to years to actually start doing what they need to do. And so if you want to, to really impact like soil salinity, for instance, you got to mix that stuff in. So just keep in mind that it does take time for these problems to be fixed. Um, it's something that I, when growers come to me with salinity problems, um, it's something I have to remind them. It took years for the situation to get as bad as it did, and so it's going to probably take years for it to recover. So I'm not going to spend too much time soil sampling. Um, although if you have any questions, I used to work in an ag testing lab before I joined Cooperative Extension. But I did want to mention that NRCS soil surveys can be useful for figuring out where you need to look at more closely. Another thing that you can do is Google Earth. You can download the app on your desktop and you can look at that site over time um, by pulling up satellite uh, photos from the past. And if there's crops grown there, you can usually see if there's a bad spot because the crops don't do so well in that area. So it can be a good way for you to look at the site and figure out areas you need to look at more closely. If that site has been farmed, irrigation and fertilization changes soil chemistry. And so some of the information in that soil survey is probably not going to be accurate. So you actually need to go in and sample. So in general, you want to sample good and bad areas. <laughs> Don't mix up those samples. It does happen. You want to make sure that you know everything that's going on in that site before that orchard is planted. Even if you've been farming that location for a while, um, things will have changed since you last put that orchard in. Um, I do want to mention you might need to add chloride as an add-on. Not all soil tests provide that information. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the guidelines in detail. I have this here for your reference. I'll show the slide a couple of times as I'm talking about it so you can take photos of it. But just in general, almonds aren't salt tolerant. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not pistachios. Just keep in mind that if you're, when you start increasing in salinity, you're going to start to see declines in yield. Um, and in really severe cases, the trees might die, although you would hope that no one would be considering that sort of site for planting almonds. Another thing to consider is that when you are doing these, considering a site for planting almonds, take into the cost of how much it's going to take to remediate that location. It may not actually um, yield you a good return on investment over a long period of time, especially if you, for instance, have a well that's a little salty, and it's going to continue to add salts to that location. Something that I saw in 2021 and 2022 was folks had planted almonds in locations where they had surface water available to them, but they had a really bad well. They never really thought about using that well because they had all the surface water they needed. When they started getting zero allocations, that's what they had to turn to to keep their trees alive, and it was causing problems in the trees. You know, we're going to be uh, facing years where there's going to be zero allocations in the future, so just think about when you're developing a new site, what's going to happen if you have to rely on that well for all of your water. Okay, so I'm going to break down some of the components a little bit if you're not familiar with, with uh, components of salinity. So EC is just a, a quick and fast way of measuring the salinity of a site, either ECE for soil or ECW for water. And from my experience working in an ag testing lab, um, sodium chloride and nitrate were big contributors to what you'd see in your EC from a soil report. It measures all salts. So salts are ionic compound composed of something positive and negative. It dissociates when you put it in water. You know, those can all contribute to EC. But when we're talking about salinity, when we refer to salts, we're usually talking about sodium and chloride. So sodium 
is positively charged, soils tend to be negatively charged, and so sodium can be difficult to remove from soils. You need to add something else to displace it. Chloride is negatively charged, and so you can leach it out fairly easily, as long as you have high quality water. Boron is not technically a salt, but it is closely associated with salinity, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, and it does cause a lot of stress to solvents as well. So the salt's impact on plants, um, you can have osmotic or specific ion effects. So osmotic effects are salts basically like to collect water around them, and water, that water that's hanging around those salts is a little bit harder for plants to pull out, and so it can negatively impact growth because that water is not cold, it's not free anymore. The plants have to work to take it up. So something like pistachios, typically they're affected by osmotic effects, but almonds, since they're salt sensitive, are also affected by specific ion effects where um, salts are taken up and they damage plant tissue. So the last thing is sodium absorption ratio, and that is a measure of sodium's impact on soil structure. Basically, sodium doesn't do good things for soil structure. It doesn't allow clay particles to collect together and bind, and that's called flocculation. And calcium and magnesium tend to be good for that. Um, they, they aid flocculation. And so sodium absorption ratio is basically a look at the effect of salinity on that site. Um, sodium, I should say. So if you have irrigation water or a soil with high SAR, you might have infiltration problems. EC, or just the total concentration of salts, actually has the opposite effect. So you may not be seeing infiltration issues if you also have high EC in your irrigation water. So again, I have this slide if you want to take some photos. For leaching, again, sodium has to be displaced with something positively charged. Um, usually what we use is uh, calcium. So depending on what your site looks like, you can either add gypsum if you don't have a lot of free lime in your soil. Um, I did want to point out that this is not a complete list of the products that you can use. Um, I think I pulled this from the pistachio production manual. But the amounts that are provided are to remediate or remove one mil equivalent of sodium per six acre inch slice. So depending on the salinity of that site, you actually might be needing to add a lot of product. So again, this is where you need to start looking at how much it's gonna to cost to do this, how much you're gonna to have to pay to continue to uh, maintain or uh, keep a salinity problem from popping up, um, depending on what your well water looks like. If your soil has a lot of free lime, you can actually add sulfur. The sulfur will break down the free lime and it'll form gypsum and it will do the same thing. And of course, uh, you have to have water to remove that sodium and chloride from the root zone. Just adding in more product is not gonna fix the problem. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but you need a lot of water depending on what your salinity is. And something to keep in mind is when you're leaching, your soil is never gonna look better than your water, so you need to make sure you have a good enough source of water and enough of it to leach. pH can also impact plant growth. The biggest way is nutrient availability. Um, I guess I'll say in some very acidic soils, aluminum can be uh, free at a very high concentration and cause damage to plant roots. We don't see that here in California. We don't really have soils that are that acidic. We tend to have soils that range between you know, 6 and 7.5, at least from what I saw working in the ag testing lab. Um, sometimes if you have a really coarse textured soil, you know, sandy, doesn't have a high CEC, and you're fertigating nitrogen, um, you can have drops in pH in that, um, that fertigation zone, but typically the bulk soil tends to have a higher pH. And then I can say you can also have a really, really high pH, but those are saline sodic sites, and you shouldn't be planting almonds there. Particularly what we're concerned about with pH is the availability of metal micronutrients. We have a method of managing that. It is uh, adding zinc um, through foliar applications. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on changing pH because I'm personally not a huge fan of trying to micromanage pH. I think it costs a lot of money. I know there are some folks out there who really feel strongly that it works for them. I think that we have developed ways <laughs> of managing um, micro micronutrient issues. But I will say, if you want to modify the pH, any ag testing lab will be able to generate um, either sulfur or lime recommendations for you very easily. For whole orchard recycling, it's becoming a very common practice. We recommend that you grind the chips so they pass through a two-inch sieve, get it done very early in the process. It helps to have a couple of passes to make sure that you're incorporating those chips all the way. 
I will say some folks have been playing around with adding compost uh, as well, both as a way to try to increase the organic matter going into the site and maybe speed up the breakdown. We don't really have much information about adding nitrogen to these sites to try to increase the rate of chip breakdown. I believe one of my colleagues is starting to look at that, but we have really good fertilization information for planting almonds and managing them their first year after a whole orchard recycling event, which I'm going to go over a little bit in my research that I'm talking about later. And, um, you know, we, and for most of these sites, we haven't done this and like the trees are growing fine after planting. So that's uh, all I'll say about that. So uh, Roger Duncan provided me the information on rootstocks in this section. Um, I did not do this research, um, but I do want to mention that, you know, we, we have rootstocks because they're great for managing nematodes and in some cases disease resistance, but they also impact a lot of other things like vigor, anchorage, yield, nut size, whole split timing and length, and salinity tolerance, and maybe nutrient uptake as well. This data is, uh, is from a, a long-term rootstock trial in the west side of Stanislaus County, and it's looking at a whole bunch of different rootstocks, so I kind of color-coded them. The green is peach almond hybrids, the orangey uh, color is just peach, and then the white is either something crossed with plum or a complex hybrid. Um, but in his trial, he found that the peach almond hybrids tended to have um, higher potassium levels in their leaves, and they also tended to have um, on the lower end of sodium accumulation in a site that had moderate salinity. There are exceptions, of course. However, Muhammad Yagmore's experiences down in Kern County were kind of the opposite. The orchard is much younger. Um, they actually found uh, that the peach almond hybrids tended to have lower potassium levels. Let's see, this is chloride accumulation. Um, so um, the peach almond hybrids did also tend to have lower chloride accumulation. This is organized by chloride levels in 2020. So in general, you know, peach almond hybrids might be a good choice if you have some salinity issues at the location. This is from uh, Catherine Jarvis Sheehan site in Yolo County. Um, basically, uh, level tended to accumulate more boron um, in a site that was located in the Crash, Cache Creek watershed, which tends to have high boron levels. Okay, so um, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about um, fertilization of non-bearing trees and some phosphorus research that I've done. So what should you worry about when you're planting your almond trees? Um, the big ones, I would say, are, are nitrogen and zinc. And after concluding this phosphorus research trial, I also say phosphorus now. Potassium and boron, those tend to be much more important for bearing trees. Um, the vegetative needs just don't seem to be as high as um, what the trees need for bearing. And I'll have a little case study of wh where you can go wrong with over applying potassium to non-bearing trees. In general, uh, with almonds, you can over fertilize with nitrogen. You can do it with other crops as well. I haven't fried almonds, but I've fried pistachios a couple of times. Um, they tend to be pretty sensitive to really heavy rates of nitrogen, especially when it's hot and they're taking up a lot of water. So um, I know David Dahl did some research before he left and he found that he looked at different sources of nitrogen fertilizer for first leaf trees. And he also looked at rates. And so he found that the source of nitrogen didn't really matter. They got uh, the same growth with every, with uh, whatever form of nitrogen he included. But they found that the rate that first leaf trees needed was approximately you know, three to four ounces of nitrogen per tree. There's been a lot of research looking at holer to recycling. There's been an, a bit of an evolution there. Early on, back in the Iron Wolf days, which if anyone's ever listened to Brent Holtz's talk, um, you guys know what I'm talking about, they thought that you needed to double the amount of nitrogen that you added per tree to make sure that you didn't have nitrogen starvation. However, when he and May started to do, May Columber, um, started to do timing trials, they found that you actually don't need to do that if you get the nitrogen on very close to leaf out. So we used to say you want to wait for about six inches of growth before you start fertilizing the tree, and they found that in a whole orchard recycled site, if you get that on very early, um, you'd actually probably don't need to increase the rate, and you can keep it about three to four ounces of nitrogen per tree. So 
Um, I do have fertilization rates further on. It's rare, but sometimes I do see sites where you're getting some yield in the second leaf. Um, so I would say if you aren't, you know, stick with that same rate of nitrogen per tree. If for some reason you decide to harvest that site, um, I would switch to fertilizing based off of yield. And of course, third leaf on, you want to switch to fertilizing based off of yield because those yield values do take into account um, vegetative growth demands. And of course, don't apply more than one ounce of actual nitrogen in a month. And if you're applying it all at once, um, yeah, just be careful. Okay, so potassium. I'm not aware of any rate trials for potassium for non-bearing trees. Um, the vegetative needs are about 20 to 30 pounds a tree. Um, I don't think, uh, in mature orchards, I don't think that's so different in non-bearing trees. Something to keep in mind, too, is that unlike nitrogen, potassium is not mobile in soils. You know, it's positively charged soils or negatively charged, it's going to stick around. Um, and so you can get into danger if you start really trying to push on that potassium. We have some values for, I think they were developed for vegetative crops, you know, about 2% of the CEC or 200 parts per million. Probably means that your, your soils have uh, good potassium levels, but of course, if you're bearing, you want to be base, uh, applying what has been removed. I did go on a farm call once to an al a very, very vigorous almond orchard in a, a very sandy soil here in Merced County. And they had these weird deficiency symptoms in their leaves. And after talking to them and looking at their leaf tissue analysis, I found out that while they had actually been really hammering the site with potassium to try to build up potassium in the soil, before they started bearing, what happens is they actually induced a magnesium deficiency. So you can have what's called cation imbalances where um, adding a lot of one uh, ion can actually impede the uptake of other ions. It also displaces cations from the cation exchange capacity. So just like we use calcium to remove sodium, adding a different kind of cation like potassium can displace other cations from the CEC. So this can be fixed, but you know, and I don't think it's applicable everywhere, but it is kind of, you know, be careful if you have a sandy soil with a low CEC and yields aren't great, you can probably cause some problems. Okay, something I did want to mention for leaf sampling. I've personally seen this myself in my fertilization projects with non-bearing trees. You might get leaf critical values that don't quite make sense. And it's important to keep in mind that these leaf critical values have been developed for bearing trees. So they're shipping out nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to the fruit. And something else to keep in mind, too, is that when you're sampling in a mature orchard, you're sampling spur leaves that have formed at the beginning of the season, and they're accumulating calcium and magnesium throughout the entire season, because that's just what happens. That's, um, the, the leaves uh, increase in those values over time. And so if you're not sampling leaves that have been formed very early in the season, you're probably not. You might be sampling something that's like a recently matured leaf you might have values that are much lower for calcium and magnesium, higher for nitrogen and potassium because you, know, you don't have those, those dynamics going on. Keep in mind that you know, if the, the trees are vigorous um, and the leaves aren't showing zinc deficiency, so small, needle-shaped, tiny inner nodes, you, 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 know, you, you might get, um, the trees might be fine, but you're still getting values that don't quite fit with the sufficiency standards. Something else to keep in mind too, um, zinc, if you do it as a foliar spray, binds to the leaf cuticle. So if you've done a zinc foliar spray, your values from your leaf tissue test, aren't, they're not accurate. They're gonna be reflecting what's landed on those leaves. So I'm gonna go over um, my phosphorus fertilization trial. This project started off as a, I guess, kind of an offshoot of some anaerobic soil disinfestation work that um, my collaborator on this project, CoPI, um, Greg Brown, was doing, um, where he's been looking at non-chemical ways to disinfest soils uh, before planting new almonds to try to alleviate prunus replant disease. And he was really interested in phosphorus because the substrate that's done really well, rice bran, has a lot of phosphorus in it. Um, I was interested in looking at phosphorus because I would get asked about it and I would say, no, your trees don't need it. Um, although as you'll see, <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> we decided to put in a fertilization trial in an anaerobic soil disinfestation site that we had done west of Chowchilla. And because we had a lot of rain at just the wrong time and we couldn't fumigate that site. So rather than have two non-fumigation controls, we thought, hey, 
we'll look at this, uh, this, this nutrient um, thing that we've been you know, kind of thinking about. So the site was planted um, in March 2019, and it was a Butte Padre Orchard on Nemegard. The grower did recycle that site before planting. It was microsprinkle irrigation, and I'm bringing that up because the grower did apply some nutrients that you can see down there through the irrigation system and as a foliar spray, but we don't think that a lot of that was taken up by the plants because it's a very inefficient way. Um, the foliar spray in general, you know, even though it's low rates, you know, the trees are tiny, they're not intercepting a lot of that spray. Uh, and the microsprinkler is applying it to a much larger area than the roots probably are exploring. The soil test levels were, they're fine for Olson. Um, and it was a, a, on the lower end of pH um, from what you'd expect to see in the Central Valley. So because at the time we were just interested in looking at nutrients um, to see, you know, maybe this, uh, some sort of fertilization uh, program can help you deal with prunish replant disease. We just were interested in looking at everything. So we had two complete fertilizers. We had triple 15 and a slow release. Um, we had just phosphorus, just nitrogen in the form of urea. And because we had also been thinking, you know, prunus replant disease, trees that are suffering from that tend to have short stubby roots, you know, and micronutrients are not uh, mobile in soil. Maybe this is a micronutrient uptake problem. So we had just a straight micronutrient blend. You'll see that the rates for nitrogen are higher for the slow release. Um, that is because we hand applied the triple 15, the phosphorus and the nitrogen once a month, and we did the slow release in the micros once, and we missed an application for um, our monthly fertilizers, but um, we'll see from the results as if there's not a significant difference between those. So what we did was we, um, we hand applied the fertilizer in holes that we um, dug about 12 inches from the tree. We made sure it was in the wetted zone. We applied it six inches deep because again, phosphorus isn't mobile in soil, so we wanted to make sure it was in that root zone. And we measured the trees um, before fertilization and in October, we started about a month after planting and we pulled leaf values. So our measurements are trunk cross-sectional area. Um, we did not do this to the trees. This is from something different, but you, what you're basically doing is, so you're trying to, if you can see that, you're trying to estimate this right here, which is where if you chop that tree off and you measure that surface area, and we were picking 12 inches above the ground. So it's positively correlated with um, growth and vigor and yield, so it's just a good measurement of how well the trees are doing. We calculated significant differences with 95% confidence intervals, and the error bars you're going to see in all the graphs are 95% confidence intervals. So we only saw Padre respond to the fertilizer, but we were shocked to see that the trees receiving phosphorus grew just as well as trees receiving a complete fertilizer and only nitrogen, and numerically they were actually greater. We only fertilized in the first year, and we still saw the effects in the second year. I'm showing the leaf values. Uh, we didn't see anything for nitrogen and phosphorus, and we could never really think of a good explanation for the pattern here. Um, but basically, there's no difference in nitrogen and phosphorus leaf values um, in July or September. That's all I'll say about that. So because we were so surprised, we decided we had to check this out again in another site. So we found another site east of Chowchilla, and we only looked at phosphorus fertilizer. And we picked um, six ounces of P2O5. Um, we did the same application method as before, but we only applied it once. Oh, sorry, I think we did this one twice. Um, we split up over two applications. So this site, the grower also independently recycled the orchard. They did fumigate prior to planting. They also applied a really heavy rate of composted chicken manure that was concentrated on the berms. Um, this site was Monterey Nonpareil on Viking, um, and it was planted about two years later. We fertilized in March. This site also had two different soil types, and they were arranged in such a way that we could kind of split the experiment across the soil types, because we were wondering maybe soil type plays into this. Long story short, it didn't, so all the results are pooled. Um, but you can see the Olsen phosph phosphorus levels are much higher. This is sampled just before fertilization. And so I thought, you know, with these heavy rates of composted chicken manure and much higher phosphorus, we're not going to see anything, and we did. Again, only one cultivar responded. non did not. Monterey did. And applying phosphorus improved growth. 
Clearly, phosphorus seems to be important when you're dealing with newly planted almond trees. We were wondering, we didn't really think that wood chips were tying up phosphorus, but it is a fairly new practice when it comes to planting orchards in the state. So we were interested in looking at this as a, some sort of replicated trial. We were also interested to know if fumigation might have played a role because that's another you know, common decision that growers need to make before planting. So we moved to the Kearney Ag and Research Center in Parlier, where we could have complete control over everything. Uh, and so this site was an old peach orchard that was removed and burned. So for a whole orchard recycling treatment, we did have to import the chips and they weren't, the orchard wasn't treated in a way that most growers would. I think they were imported and incorporated not too far before planting. It's a Hanford sandy loam. pH is higher, phosphorus levels are closer to what you saw in the first experiment. Because we were looking at whole orchard recycling, we did want to add a nitrogen component to this. So we looked at the standard rate of nitrogen, three and a half ounces of nitrogen per tree. We added on a higher rate where we ended up at five and a half ounces of nitrogen per tree. We added phosphorus to the standard rate and we split that site into two experiments. So one, we were looking at fertilization and fumigation. At the second trial, we were looking at fertilization, fumigation, and whole orchard recycling. So we applied the phosphorus fertilizer as we did before. We applied the nitrogen fertilizer as urea. Surface applied it, and because we could just walk over to the edge of the field and turn on the system, that's what we did every single time we applied it, and we ran the water for about an hour just to push that urea in. So for the first trial, which again is just fumigation and fertilization, we only saw nonpareil respond to phosphorus, but it grew more. When it was the phosphorus treatment grew significantly more than the high nitrogen treatment, and we saw that effect carry over into year two. We saw a lot of fumigation responses. This is the only one I'm gonna show. Um, I think we know that fumigation is good if you're dealing with a, a, a replanting site where you might have prunus replant disease. And I could say we had it here because the way to figure out if you have prunus replant disease is if your trees respond to fumigation. But I came on to this job after Greg Brown did all of his fumigation research, so I thought it was pretty shocking to see just how much trees respond to fumigation if you have prunus replant disease. The trees grew twice as much. So if you're thinking about poor performance in a newly planted orchard, you know, fumigation can really be important if you're uh, having a prunus follow a prunus. So for Kearney trial number two, uh, so this is fertilization, fumigation, and whole recycling. We saw a response in both cultivars, but it was different. So for nonpareil, we only saw a response to fertilizer in year one. And again, the trees grew a little bit more with phosphorus, although um, there wasn't a difference in year two. And for Monterey, we saw an interaction with fumigation where in fumigated soil, we actually saw a growth depression with a high nitrogen treatment. But again, phosphorus improved tree growth. So we didn't see any interaction with the wood chips for either the high nitrogen or the phosphorus treatments. I think we confirmed that wood chips didn't really play a role into this phosphorus response. The three to four ounces of nitrogen per tree is sufficient for first leaf planted or first leaf almonds. So in summary, we examined phosphorus fertilization in the context of fumigation, whole tree recycling, moderate to high levels of soil phosphorus, pre-plant compost, and different rootstocks and cultivars. And we found that almonds respond to phosphorus if um, in their first year. We also, what we thought was pretty surprising was that we found that soil phosphorus results were a poor predictor of how the trees would respond to fertilization. That, which was surprising because that's why those phosphorus uh, sufficiency ranges were developed. It's a whether or not your crop is gonna respond to fertilization. When we were writing up the, the article, um, I did a literature review and I actually found that was also the case um, with some phosphorus fertilization trials in um, young olives and apples. So maybe it's just a tree thing. I'll say, so this doesn't have, show any evidence that mature trees need phosphorus. We don't have any evidence to the contrary. So Franz Niederholzer has been looking at this up at Nichols Soil Lab. We also didn't do rate trials. That's something I'm interested in doing in the future. Um, or doing multiple years of phosphorus fertilization, but um, I do think that adding uh, phosphorus to newly planted almond orchards is a good idea. Okay, I have time for questions. Um, I'm also gonna be here throughout the rest of the meeting. My contact information is up there. 
I have a podcast if you're interested in like listening to podcasts and we have a website where you can find um, other articles that I and some of my colleagues in the San Joaquin Valley have written. A couple of questions. Uh, compost contains quite a bit of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in organic orchards that I've been walking, years of applying it, phosphorus levels have gone way high in the soil, which I think might be of some concern in the future. Is there enough, uh, for new planting, is there enough phosphorus in, say, a ton or two of compost to stimulate the trees the way this your trial showed? Well, uh, one of our sites, the grower added three tons of composted chicken manure, which has a lot of phosphorus. I should have included the amounts. Um, it was definitely over 100 pounds an acre, um, and we still saw a growth response. What we're thinking is that um, you know the phosphorus fertilizer might be like a starter fertilizer like you use in veg vegetable crops. Um, it's just a high concentration of fertilizer next to the root zone. They don't have to really work too hard to find it. Um, and you know they may or may not have formed their mycorrhizal associations by then, um, but we, we did see a growth response um, at, at that site that had very high soil phosphorus levels, which I think was probably due to that, that compost application. So, we, so that would be a good idea if a I think grower so. just, in fact, an organic grower, he could just apply compost and do fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are some uh, organic forms of phosphorus available too that he can apply, but... Uh, right. we, don't, we don't have a comparison site of compost versus no compost. So we just had that one site where they, they did it to everything. But it is worth looking at, for sure. Yeah. The other question is, is, I've often recommended that growers use triple 15 mm -hmm. as their fertilizer. And, and I, I, even though you didn't show it there, I thought David Dahl's thing showed that the trees did a little better with triple 15, maybe because of the phosphorus. At the rates we've been using, which follow the nitrogen rates, is that enough phosphorus to get the same results? Um, I mean, it depends on how much triple 15 you're applying, right? So we did have triple 15 in our first experiment where um, we, um, we used it as both our, um, I mean, it was one of our complete fertilizers um, and we tried to make sure it matched our others. So I think it could. Um, I mean, you could certainly apply enough triple 15 to get to that point. Um, it's just, you know, if you're applying it at planting, you might be risking like burning the roots from that nitrogen, which, you know, depending on how much you add can, can do that. Okay, with um, compost and having a lot of, um, if, if you have a lot of organic matter in the soil, mm -hmm. um, we've been working on this for a long time just out in the field, but it seems like there's so many um, uh, biological juices out there and, and the conventional ag companies have been doing a lot more inputs. Do you think there's times we can rev up the biology to release some of those nutrients that are locked in the soil? That's one of the questions. I, I, I can't answer that because I'm not an expert on soil my, microbiology. Um, so I, you'd have to ask a microbiologist that. Okay, and then, then back, back in the day when Mike McHenry was the nematode guy and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, talking about fumigation, he still wanted farmers to have a full year out um, you know, of fallow or not, not before planting the trees. Is anybody doing that anymore? I don't think so. Um, I mean, y yes, the longer you wait um, between planting orchards, the better, um, you know, not just for produce replant disease, for nematodes as well. Of course, you know, planting a crop is even better. Um, I don't think that those compared to fumigation, but I think that you know, a lot of people have mortgages to pay, and so they tend to try to turn those orchards over uh, in a timely manner so they can keep on paying the bills. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would help too. It just the longer you wait, the better in general. Yeah, this is a question of adaptability. In my orchard, if I'm using, I have a good source of uh, surface water, mm -hmm. and I'm using that for a number of years, and all of a sudden, I'm in drought conditions. And I have to rely on groundwater, which has a, this would have a fair amount of salinity in it. Would it be better if I introduce some of this groundwater periodically to the trees? And would they be adaptable to that rather than going for several years with just a canal water or surface water source? I don't know if anyone's done any research on that. I would say, you know, instinctually based on my opinion, 
depending on how hot the well is, yeah, you could probably shock the plants if you just very suddenly apply a very salty source of water to them. But you have to keep in mind too that salinity is also a chronic issue. And so um, you're doing damage to your soil structure and those plants will be taking up salts as well. So um, I, I mean, honestly, depending on how salty the well is, um, you might just consider planting a different salt tolerant crop if your well quality is bad enough that you're seriously concerned about the health of your trees. Um, Cause you know, if you have to do something like rely on that well for an entire year or two years, which might happen, um, you're doing long-term damage to that crop, you're impacting the soil over a long period of time. I know that might be something a little controversial to say at an almond meeting, but we, we do have salt tolerant, tolerant crops to plant. So um, that's just my opinion, but I'm not the one who is having to pay the bills and manage that crop. But um, I, I would say it, when you're thinking about you know, adaptability and resilience, you know, what, what's it gonna look like if you have to rely on a bad well for several years? I, I don't think it's out of the question that we might have to do that in the future. But for the short term, would that have any advantages? Again, I would, I would wanna see research. Um, I think conceivably you could get it to have some sort of, you wouldn't shock it if you tried to ease it into that salinity. Um, but again, because you have this chronic impact of uptake of salts over time, I don't think it's gonna make the trees necessarily more resilient. You might just get over uh, having to deal with a sudden input of salts to that site, if that makes sense. You know, it's like walking into a, a very cold, the cold ocean slowly versus just jumping in all at once. Um, maybe that's not such a great thing because people do it for fun, but um, uh, it's just, it's uh, whether or not you deal with it really quickly over a long period of time, there's gonna be damage in the long term, um, but you might possibly just not have as much of a shock in the immediate term, if that makes sense. Uh, one more quick question. I know in humans, uh, magnesium interferes with calcium uptake or a calcium absorption. Would that be true of uh, trees as well, almonds and pistachios in particular? Um, I think so, but I think that's not really an issue unless you're for some reason growing in a serpentine soil, which does tend to have you know, really wacky calcium to magnesium ratios. Uh, in our soils here, um, with our high pH soils, they have a lot of both. And so in an everyday scenario, I don't really see that being an issue. Um, it's just, you know, if you're growing in a site that just has really far, um, like, I think it's like eight times the amount of, uh, I, I actually, I can't remember that. I'd have to look it up, but it's not the common, it's not a common issue. Thank you. Hi, Phoebe. The growth responses that you measured in these trials, mm -hmm. uh, what was the methodology used to, to, to measure that? Was it like LIDAR or mm -hmm. did you guys pulling these things out of the ground and grinding and weighing? What, what was that? Uh, so we used trunk cross-sectional area. So we e measured um, caliper, so that's stem diameter when they were young. And for one site, when the trees are getting a little bit bigger, we switched to trunk circumference. So canopies were not measured or anything? No. So trunk cross-sectional area does have a good body of research that shows that it's positively correlated with um, vigor, um, which canopy area could be a um, you know one way to measure that as well. Thank you. <laughs> It is uh, foliar phosphorus an option if we can't pre-plant apply, um, you know, a soil phosphorus? Um, I haven't done rate trials. Um, you know, I know it can be done. Like our first site, the grower did do a low rate. Um, I think that with anything, um, if you're thinking about substituting a foliar application for a soil application, you have to look at how much you can get the tree to absorb at one time and how many applications you need to do to get the tree to take up what they need. And so that for bearing trees that, um, you know, for our big nutrients like nitrogen and um, potassium, that's just not economical. Um, I would wanna do the research in young almonds, but I would be concerned about frying them if you're doing heavy applications or constant applications to try to get uptake. Um, I mean, there are ways that you can apply, I mean, <laughs> There are better ways than what we did, you know, where we we're literally digging holes in the ground and dumping in the fertilizer. Um, you can drill it in, you can put it in through the irrigation system. Um, I, I think that there are better options than doing a foliar application. All right, uh, thank you, Phoebe, thank you very much. Very good questions. Um,
one round of applause again.